This morning, I, I won't keep you long. For those who don't know me, I don't preach very long. Uh, the more amens I hear, the quicker I finish. And so, if some point during the message, you're tired and you're hungry, you want to go home, just shout amen, hallelujah. I'll get the message and we can wrap this up. I'm going to ask... <laughs> <laughs> Set myself up for that one. Huh? Let us, I know I just had you stand and sit, but you know, in the church of God, you need to lose a couple pounds. You can't come to the church of God and not sweat a little when you get your praise on. So I'm going to ask if we could just stand to our feet and open the word of God to the book of Mark, the fifth chapter, Mark chapter five. I know we have technology where we can Put it up there but i'd like to ask if you have your cell phone just open up the app or your bible mark chapter 5 when you have it say amen and if you don't lord help me still your page is trying mark chapter 5 it's in the new testament second book if you see luke you've gone too far Mark chapter 5. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we dare not read your word without the guidance of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us with thy truth, for thy word is truth. In Jesus' name we do pray. Mark chapter 5, I'll read in your hearing. Verse 9, Mark chapter 5, starting with verse 9, this is what the word of the Lord says. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's it. I want you to close your Bible and look to your neighbor and ask him a simple question. What is your name? You may be seated. There's a lot of meaning in a name. Uh, everybody has a name. Whether it's good or bad, we have a name. Some of us go to school to acquire a name outside of our government name. Some of us are doctors. Some of us are lawyers. Some of us are mathematicians. Whatever it is, it has a name. Uh, you know your government name, and some of us have nicknames. Uh, whatever it may be, if you're from the streets, they come up with nicknames outside of your government names that I can never make sense of, but it's a name. For example, Peanut. I could never understand why somebody on the streets would be, want to be called Peanut or Killer. That's a name. Uh, there's many names, and we associate names with the individual. Your name is who you are. Your name gives you purpose. Your name gives you value. Uh, some of us are dealing with names that devalue us. And when asked what is our name, we forget our God-given name and associate ourselves with the name that brings us down. What is your name? Oh, when you have a name, you know the direction you're going, you know the value that you have, and you know your purpose in life. For someone who does not have a name does not know where they're going. Uh, someone who does not have a name does not know how important they are. Someone who does not have a name, that's why when you are born, one of the first things that the, doc, the hospital tells you or asks you is, what are you going to name the child? Because from that moment on, that name will be associated with that child until their very last breath. Uh, what is your name? The text that we just read is not a complicated text. It's a very familiar text for many of us where Jesus is talking to a demon-possessed man and he asks him, what is your name? And the response is, my name is Legion, for we are many. 
Uh, you can go home and read the book of Mark when you get a chance, but Mark starts off with the, John, the story of John the Baptist, of how he paved the way for one who'd be greater than himself, whose shoes he couldn't tie, and he was making the way for Jesus. Jesus was stepped onto the scene, and he started to heal demons and, and heal the sick and um, cl a clean house all over Galilee. He was preaching the word. He was doing what God called him to do. And as he did what he needed to do, his name traveled everywhere. Uh, to, the book, to the fourth chapter, we come to the, the chapter before chapter five where they're on a boat and he's sleeping in the boat and the disciples are about to lose their lives because they're in the midst of the storm. And Peter stops and turns around and calls on the name of Jesus and says, care us not that we perish. Jesus steps up, wipes the sleep out of his eyes, and he says, peace, be still. Everybody on the boat is in amazement. And they're asking the question, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They get, they get to the other side, and as Jesus and the disciples are walking, a demon-possessed man runs now towards Jesus, and the demons know who he is. All throughout the book of Mark, before we get to that point, the Bible tells us that Jesus would um, confront demons and the demons would ask him, Jesus, son of God, what have you to do with us? They knew who Jesus was. And here, Jesus is confronted with this demon-possessed man. This was no new situation. Jesus knew who he was. He knew he was sent by the Father. He knew that there was nothing he could do on earth unless God the Father gave him permission to. He knew who he was. When he stepped on the scene, he only did what his name carried him to do. Uh, he healed the blind. He caused the blind to see. He caused the lame to walk. He healed the sick. He called the, caused the deaf to hear. He even raised dead people. He gave the dead life. And demons was nothing new. Every time he stepped somewhere and people brought him demon-possessed people, all Jesus would have to say is tell the demon, come out of the person, and the demon would have no choice but to leave because they knew who was speaking to them. They had history with Jesus. Uh, before the foundations of the world, they knew who Jesus was. They knew that Jesus was the Son of God. And if God said something, even if they didn't want to do it, they had to do it because he was God all by himself. Do you know Jesus? Uh, Jesus should be no stranger to us. The Bible is clear that Jesus is the Son of God. No matter, there's no question, if, ands, buts about it. As a matter of fact, the word of God says he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty. Do you know Jesus? He comes to the other side and he's talking to this demon-possessed man and he says, what is your name? We know God knows everything. God is all-powerful. God is the only God who will give you the answer now and tell you the solution and why he gave that to you later on. He's the only one who can say, let there be light on the first day and then create the sun on the fourth day. Yeah, I missed that, but he gives you the solution before he explains to you why he did it. That's God. But we come to the text right now and Jesus asks this demon-possessed man, what is your name? Which would suggest that God who knows all, who is all, and who's in all does not know this demon-possessed name. But it's not that Jesus doesn't know who his name is. Because the verse right before that, you can read it in your Bible, the Bible tells us that Jesus told the demon to leave the man. And then we come to verse 9, and we have Jesus having a conversation. You would think he's having a conversation with the demons, but he's actually having a conversation with the man. I know y'all missed that. Let me help you unpack that. You see, demons listen when God talks. If God tells you them to go left, they go left. He tells them to go right, they go right. But we come to a story in the Bible where Jesus is talking to a demon-possessed man, and when he tells the demons to leave, they don't leave. 
And what audacity do they have? What right do they have to, to disregard the word of God? Because for the first four chapters in the book of Mark, whenever Jesus told the demon to leave, it would flee. But I would like to suggest to you today that the reason why the demon did not leave is because the demon possessed man did not want the demon to leave. I know y'all missed that. Let me help y'all understand that. Some of us don't realize the reason why God is unable to work miracles in our lives is because we refuse to trust in the power of God. My first point for you today is God knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God knows that if he tells you you're healed, you're healed at that very moment. But yet, this man who comes to Jesus, when Jesus tells him for the demons to leave, the demons don't leave. But it's because it's not that the demons don't want to follow the word of God, but because the man was so accustomed to the demon that he did not know life without the demon. There are many of us in God's church today who are struggling with demons and we're praying night after night, asking God to deliver us. And we, we like to question God, God, why am I in this situation right now? The reason is not because of God, but it's because of a lack of trust in our God. Okay, y'all not with me. Let me help y'all understand this. Uh, you see, we have a doctrine. We, 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 there are certain things that we understand that, that make us who we are. But we don't have a revelation. See, we can have a doctrine, but when there's no revelation, then there's no transformation. Let me help y'all understand that. If we know that God is able, if we know that God is just, then we must live our life as if God heals us every day. That the devil does not have power over our lives. But we come here week after week complaining about what the devil has done to us when we need to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Because last time I checked, the devil was defeated. God knows our name. Hence why the psalmist says, oh, give thanks for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so when he was redeemed from the enemy hand of the enemy. God knows who we are. We are not a mistake. God did not forge us or create us because he was bored. We all have a purpose. Turn to your neighbor and say, God knows who you are. See, that's, that's the first point. God knows who we are. You may not know me. The person next to you may not know you, but God knows you. When everybody leaves you in your life, God knows you. God knows your name. So when we get to the text and Jesus is asking this man, what is your name? He's not talking to the demons. He's talking to the man because the man got so accustomed with having issues in his life that he could not see himself without it. Can I go a little deeper? We've experienced it. You've heard it. You know that brother or sister where every time you talk to them, all they want to do is complain about what's wrong in their lives. All they want to do is talk about the negativity. All they want to do is complain. But why is it as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, we complain week after week? It's because we don't know our name. My second point. It's simply this. Do you know your name? See, God knows our name. But do you know your name? Because in the text, when Jesus asked the man, what is your name? The man did not hesitate. He proudly, he stood up boldly and said, my name is Legion. 
My name is Legion. And many of us, we do the same thing. We come, people ask us how we're doing. I'm hurting today. I don't feel good today. I'm unhappy today. I'm miserable. I'm suffering. And we give ourselves these names because all throughout the week, we, the devil was beating us up. We were fighting with the devil and we lost night after night. And because we lost, we assume the name that the devil has given us. They say, if you continue to tell a child that they're nothing, when they grow up, they will believe that they are nothing. But I say to you today, if you think you are nothing, then you will act like you are nothing. Hence why it is so important for you to know your name. Turn to your neighbor and say, I know my name. It, it, help, it makes me think about when I was younger. And I don't know if they, do, they, they deal with this right now, but when I was in school, there was always a time, school would start in September, and my parents, you, you would always have to go school shopping because you had to go to school with the newest clothes and the nicest sneakers or else you get bullied. They, they talk about you. They, I guess they don't do that now, but back in my time, if someone was wearing something that looked bad, you talk about that person. I remember this one day, my father, he came back home with a bag of clothes. He didn't go with me, but he came back. He said, David, I have, I have clothes for you for the new year. I said, thanks, Dad. And he, and he said, I, I even bought you a brand new pair of sneakers. I got excited because at that time, I thought he got me the latest Jordans or the Patrick Ewings because everybody knew that name. But when I looked at the box, there was no name on it. And so I thought maybe this, but the sneakers were so expensive that they didn't even put the name on the outside. It was on the inside. And when I pulled it up, pulled it out, there was still no name on it. I looked at it. I turned it around. I, I looked at it upside down. There was still no name on it. And I talked to my dad. I said, Dad, you, you, you must not love me. Because if you loved me, you knew, you would know that I can't go to school with no-name sneakers. Okay, y'all don't understand that. Okay, so let me help y'all understand. Because at that time, if you didn't have Nikes, then you weren't wearing anything. And the name was so important that when you had good quality sneakers, like some Jordans, you didn't only wear the sneakers but you walked with a towel in your back pocket. Because while you were walking in a crowd, if anybody happened to touch your sneakers, you would whip out the towel and wipe them down. Because you had to keep the sneakers clean. Because there was a name on it. Okay, y'all missed that. Let me help y'all understand that. As seven-day Adventists, we must know our name. Every time the devil beats us up, we should pull out the word of God and say, greater is he that is in me than him that is in the world today. Because I know my name. Everybody else knows their name except for us. Can I pick on Seventh-day Adventists for a second? Everybody knows their name except for us. The LGBTQ, whatever, QRS, LMNOP, they know their names. And they're not hiding it. They come out, express themselves, say what they want to say, do what they want to do, and you can't say nothing about it because they know their name. We are living in a world where people, everybody else, is proud to say their name except for seven-day Adventists. The atheists can walk around. They can deny God. They can say they don't believe in God. And nothing happens to them. We're even living in a world today where as a black man, you can't express your opinion without society criticizing you. 
Okay, you don't understand. Kyrie Irving, he made a statement. And because of the statement that he made, they associated with it. And he stood by his statement. He had no ill intent, but he stood by it. And I wish he stayed by it, but then for whatever reason unknown, he made an apology for it. But I, I come here to tell you as Seventh-day Adventists, we need to stop apologizing for what we believe because we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because he died for all of us. And to be a Seventh-day Adventist is not like every other religion. It breaks my heart when people want to sit there and say, I'm a Christian. It's okay to be a Christian, but it's even better to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Can I, can I toot our horns a little bit? And I'm not talking about all the negativity, because we all go through struggles in our churches. And if you think there's another religion that's better than this religion, I guarantee you, if you join another religion, you're going to run into the same problems. But what I love about my church is from the moment that I was born, there were certain doctrines that we never questioned. We knew that the Sabbath was the seventh day and we weren't ashamed about it. When we came to church, when people asked us where we're going, we said, we're going to church today. And when they asked us, when are we coming back? We won't be back till the sun sets because the, this, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We understood the Sabbath day and we weren't knocking anybody. But Adventists, let me, let me tell you something because we, we, we got the Sabbath a little twisted. The Sabbath is not for Adventist folks. The Sabbath is for the whole world. Let, let, let me help you out. Sabbath is not something only for Adventists to acknowledge. The Sabbath is a day where we, we put aside our burdens and our cares and we say, God is my Lord and my maker. He is the one who provides all my needs. That's the Sabbath day where we turn aside from all our situations and we focus on what God is doing in our lives. Uh, to be an Adventist, you understand the spirit of prophecy. You understand that. Listen, God used an individual to guide us to reading the word of God. It's unfortunate that we've used spirit of prophecy to abuse people. But when spirit of prophecy is used the right way, you cannot read the spirit of prophecy without having a desire to read the word of God. We believe that. That's who we are. And that's what we must stand by. But yet we are ashamed. We believe in the state of the dead. We understand that when somebody dies, their spirit, their, their, their aura does not go back to, and come out of the grave and haunt us at night. We believe that when we die, we die. We know nothing. We feel nothing. We cannot hear anything. Until that day when the clouds are rolled back, and Jesus makes the shout of an archangel and he says the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we who are alive, we will be taken up also. But we know until then the dead are where we left them. I don't need, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit there and make somebody feel bad if they believe that their grandmother's up in heaven watching down. But I know what my Lord has told me. And given the opportunity, I will talk to them and say, listen, I know you might think that it's your grandmother watching you, but my Bible tell me it's Jesus Christ. He never leaves me nor forsakes me because I know his name. We believe in the sanctuary message. We believe that there was a day of atonement where the priest would come in, in into the most holy place and offer the sins of the whole community. And God the Father would accept that sacrifice. And, and Jesus is the one who fulfilled that. We believe in that. Why is it we've stopped talking about it? Why is it we've stopped teaching our young people about it? It would appear as if we are ashamed of who we are. But we also believe in the second coming of Jesus. See, last, when I used to grow up, all the pastor had to say is Jesus is coming again and everybody would go crazy. 
But for some reason, we're not excited about the second coming. But I've come here to tell you that Jesus is closer today than he was yesterday. And if you don't believe it, you better ask somebody because my Bible tells me that he's coming and he's coming for all of us who trust in the Jesus Christ. We believe that. That's why our parents used to say, lift up the trumpet and loud let it sing. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrim. Be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Do you know who you are? God knows who you are. We need to know who we are. We are a people that even though we fail, God picks us back up. We are a people even though our righteousness is as filthy rags, we are saved not by our righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And why can I say that? Because in Revelation 7, John, um, John is in a revel uh, talking to an angel and he sees a group of people coming out singing glory to God. And the angel asks John, who are these people? John turns back. He knows that he says, you know, who are they? And the angel says, these are they who came out of great tribulation and who washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Church, do you want to know what that means? If we, no matter what we are going through, we are still God's children. Okay, y'all missed that. Let me go back to the story. Uh, you see, when the, when the demon possessed man came to Jesus, he still had demons in him. Okay, I didn't catch that. Let me help you understand that. The demons didn't leave him before he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus with the demons still inside of him. In our church, we have this mentality that if you're going through problems in your life, the last place you should be is in the house of God. But when I read this Bible, when I read this scripture, this tells me that no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what you're dealing with in your life, the first place we need to come is the church. The first place we need to be is in church. When you're hungry, you go to the supermarket. When you need a car, you go to the dealership. When you have sin problem, come to church. It's almost as if in every church I go to, I ask them, you know, oh, how's the church going? And they say, it's not the same after COVID. People left. People have the desire now to watch church on, on, on YouTube and all. That's, that was good and effective during COVID. But now we're in a time where we can come. We have no problem going to work every day. We have no problem going to the bank every day. But why is it we have a problem to come to church? God asked for one day out of seven days. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now, 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 anybody. Now, if you're sick and you can't make it, uh, uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you stay home. But you, we have no excuse anymore. Back in the day, if our car broke down, we couldn't go to church because we didn't know we didn't have cell phones. And so the next week they would ask what happened is like the car broke down. We can't do that today. Your car break down, you can't use that excuse. Oh, I, I can't come to church because I don't got a ride. Uh, yeah, you do. There's called Uber and Lyft. <laughs> I mean, wh 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 why is it? You see, when you know who you are, you don't let circumstances stop you. When you know who you are, you don't let people criticize you. When you know who you are, you won't let people stop you from coming into the house of God. Because last time I checked, this place is God's house. And in his word, he says, his house shall be called a house of prayer. So I want to encourage us to stop talking about each other and start praying for one another because God's house is not a house of gossip, but should be called a house of prayer. Every single time people want to talk about other people, 
Did you see what so-and-so had on? Did you see so-and-so they have those things in their ears? Oh, did you see so-and-so they eat chicken? So what? If you're holy and better, I ain't mad at you. Pray for me. See, let me tell you, there's only one heaven, okay? There's, there's only one heaven, Elder. If we can't get along down here, one of us ain't going to make it up there. But my only concern is this. Listen, if you're holy, saved, sanctified, and your name is righteous and all of that good stuff, go ahead. Go into the pearly gates when Jesus Christ comes. I'm not mad at you. As a matter of fact, if every last one of you is better than me because you think your name is higher than mine, go into the pearly gates. My concern is simply this. When God closes that gate, I'm on the inside rather than the outside. Because it doesn't matter if you're first or last. All that matters is that we are all children of the living God. Do you know your name? Your name is not broke. Your name is not darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. We are not hungry. Jesus is the bread of life. That's who we are. And so we have to start walking with our heads up. When people talk about us, bless them in the name of Jesus. Don't knock them. They don't know any better. Because God is going to fight all our battles. Uh, uh, the text tells us, you see, okay. Jesus asked the man, what is your name? And um, he says, my name is Legion. And so the, we, the two first two points is that God knows our name. Second point is, do you know your name? Uh, do you know your name is saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost Valley? Y'all don't know that? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> you see, see, yet people want to call us our problems, but our problems don't name us. You see, the third point is this, because when he said his name was Legion, the man gave a reason. He said, the reason why my name is Legion is because we are many. And what that tells me is that apparently his problems had a democracy. Uh, uh, a democracy is when you vote on a situation and whoever has the majority wins. Uh, so, so it was the man and all the demons. And, and there, they must have came a point in the man's life where he looked at all his problems and he said, you know what? When I look at all my problems, my problems outweigh who I am. And so he, they took a vote and they realized, he realized that he is not who he is. He is who his problems say he is. But I've come here to tell you that being a child of God, it's not a democracy. It's a dictatorship. I know y'all don't like that word, but let me help you understand that. Uh, there's only one name that matters, and that name is Jesus. There's only one name that's above any name, and that name is Jesus. You're dealing with cancer? Jesus. You're dealing with stress? Jesus. You're going through a divorce? Jesus. You're hurting at night? Jesus. You're crying in pain? Jesus. There's only one name! That God has given us under heaven, which way we, we might be saved. And that name is Jesus. No matter what problems we're going through, the name is Jesus. Hence why the Bible tells us that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's only one name that matters. It's Jesus. Okay, y'all don't understand. Let me help you out. Listen, basically what I'm trying to tell you is it doesn't matter what anybody else says. If God be for you, 
Oh, y'all read the same Bible I read. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, it, don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many battles we might lose uh, because God has told us for we are more than what? Okay, y'all read the same Bible. It does not matter what other people think. All that matters is what God says. People can call you stubborn. People can call you evil. People can call you wicked. But at the end of the day, all that matters is Jesus. Okay, I, I know y'all still don't get it. All right, I don't have any hair anymore because, you know, I'm getting older. But back in my time, uh, there was a thing called barbershops. I, I know they still got it. Uh, and the reason I know they still got it is because they charge an arm and a leg for a haircut. And so, but my father, he was a cheap person. And, and so he didn't believe in sending us to the barbershop. And so uh, um, he never went to barber school. Um, and so if I couldn't go to a barbershop, I would have to go to my father. And so he would sit me down and he didn't have clippers. Y'all laughing, but this is real talk. Uh, so he would sit me down. He didn't have a, the, the, the thing the barber throws around your neck with the paper and, you know, and cover your clothes. He didn't have that. He would just tell me, he would get the kitchen table and tell me to sit down. And as I would sit down, uh, he would pull out scissors and he would start cutting away. And then he had, and once he cut my hair, then he would get soap and water. And you're like, what would he do with that? Uh, what he would do is he would take the soapy water and he would put it on my forehead and around the, the edges of my hair. And then he would get a razor blade and he would line me up that way. Cause as the soap dried, the razor blade would leave a line of what he was making. And so, okay, I got a haircut. When I went to school the next day, every last person who saw me laughed at me. Because in that time, you could, the, the barber, anybody could mess up on your haircut. But the one thing you cannot mess up is the lineup. And my father wore glasses, but for some reason, a straight line was never straight when he lined me up. And so all throughout school, my friends would laugh at me. Even the teachers, they wouldn't call me because they didn't want any attention drawn me when I wanted to answer a question. So I, I'd get on the bus, they'd laugh at me and be like, your hairline is crooked, uh, you, uh, who's your barber? And I was ashamed. I remember one day I came home and I knocked on the door and my mother answered. And she looked at me, she didn't laugh, she just turned her head to the side. And she said, you still my baby boy. Y'all missed that. Let me help y'all understand. <laughs> when your father does something in your life, the world might talk about you. They might criticize you. They might write you off. They might laugh at you. But glory be to God, you are still God's children because he is your maker and he is your king and God knows your name. No matter the struggle, no matter the issue, God knows your name. I'm done. I'm done. God knows your name. He knows your name. Do you know your name? Do you know that even if you forget everything else, the only thing that matters is the name of Jesus. The only thing that saves us is the name of Jesus. That's why we sing, there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Is there anybody here who loves Jesus? Is there anybody here who loves Jesus? Tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. We all have the victory. Turn to your neighbor and say, we have victory in Jesus. When it's all said and done, Jesus is what matters. The story ends and it says this. When the people came back, they saw him seated in his right frame of mind, 
at the foot of Jesus. Who they, and they were afraid. They saw the man that was demon possessed. They knew his issues. The last time they saw him, he was crazy. But the next time they saw him, they were afraid of him. Do you want to know why they were afraid of him? Because he met Jesus. And I want to tell anybody who's not here, who's at home, who's afraid to come to church because they went through something and the church knows their business, give it to Jesus. And then you come to church next Sabbath and people are going to look at you. They're going to be like, ain't that so-and-so, dot, dot, dot. Ain't that sister so-and-so, dot, dot, dot. But they're going to be afraid because they're going to look at you and say, how is it? That they went through what they went through. I know what they went through. And they still have the audacity to come and sit in the house of God. It's simple. Because I know my name. My name is saved. My name is redeemed. My name is blessed. Because that's what my father told me. And no matter what you tell me, I know my name. No matter what I'm going through, I know my name. My question to you is, do you know your name? Somebody here might be dealing with a problem, dealing with demons in their lives. For years, you've had demons and you've been wondering why you still have that problem. I've come here to tell you it's because you refuse to let it go. But in the name of Jesus, I command you to let those demons go right now. Let them go. They have no place in your life. Because the moment they leave, Jesus is going to step in. I'm going to ask if we can stand to our feet. I'm going to make an appeal for prayer. You're going through something. You're dealing with something. Whatever it may be, give it to Jesus. If that's you, please come to the front so we can pray right now. Whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is you're dealing with, don't look around. This is between you and Jesus. You and Jesus. This is between you and Jesus. I wait. Come. 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 Come to God. Come to God. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Stop looking at who's, what God is doing right now. Start praying. Start praying. Start praying. Hold the hand of the person next to you if you're here right now. Hold the hand of the person next to you. You are not by yourself. You are not by yourself. Our heads are bowed our eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the name that is above all names. That name is Jesus. Father, we ask for forgiveness for holding on to our problems, for holding on to the demons in our lives, thinking that the devil was stronger than you. Thank you for reminding us, Father, that greater is he that is in us than him that is in the world today. Father, your people have heard your word and they've come from the left, the right, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And Father, you know what they're going through. At this moment, may your Holy Spirit touch them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Remove anything that is not of you and fill them with your love. Fill them with your mercy. And Father, when they leave here, may they leave here knowing that grace and mercy shall follow them all the days of their life and they will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But until the soon return of your son, Jesus Christ, may we live every day knowing that we are victorious in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen, amen, and amen. God bless you and have a happy Sabbath. Jesus, Jesus.
precious. 